Welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm your host, Ellen Barrett. Thank you for joining us today. We have a great show for you today, and we are starting off with a new face on the show. Jack Orton, he's the director of Wisconsin Business World Conference. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. First time on Talk of the Town. First time. Going good so Gonna far. Be the best time. I'm I haven't sure. scared him away yet. Not quite yet. Not <laughs> You'll yet. be coming back and telling us more every month. Hopefully, yeah. Awesome. So let's just start off with. I know we've had Business World on before, and we've explained a little bit of what it's about, but for those who maybe have, may not have caught that segment, what is Wisconsin Business World? So basically, Wisconsin Business World is an educational program um, okay. for high school students, and it teaches them the values of free enterprise, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. capitalism, all the things that make the big, beautiful world of business tick. Um, and it was founded in 1982. Um, actually, our parent organization, the WMC Foundation, which is a 501c3 charitable foundation, it was awesome. founded on the premise of having, establishing a high school student education program like the one we have. So tradition is a big thing for us. We've been going for 34 years, hoping for 35 this awesome. coming summer. Um, so history, tradition are a great big part of uh, of business world's curriculum, but um, for the most part, it it really puts students in the driver's seat mm -hmm. with a firsthand um, experience of them running a company. And when I say run a company, I mean they spend four days, three nights on the campuses of St. Norbert College in De Pere and Edgewood College in uh, here in Madison. They spend four days, three nights with students their own age in high school. Um, going through what a company experiences in real life. Um, not in real time, but in real sure. life. And what we do is try and convey to them, you know, here are the different obstacles that you're going to have to overcome to make sure that your business either lives or, or perishes. And so it's really cool in the sense that um, students are really engaging. And when I say they run their own company, they pick the product, they pick wow. the name, they assign the roles within the company, and, and they are really in charge of, you know, the marketing and the accounting and everything else. And so it's, it's really a cool way of exposing kids to all the th uh, that hu great, big, beautiful world of business, like I said, that um, is sometimes de-emphasized um, in, in high school education. But is there anything else like Wisconsin Business World out there today? Sure, sure. There, um, of course, like anything else, there are other programs, I mean, with ages ranging from middle school to uh, sure. underclassmen in college. Um, we, however, are the only program that mm -hmm. is an overnight business education program in Wisconsin that is taught by business professionals from all over the state. Um, we have mentors coming in and teaching these kids about, you know, okay, well, that's, that's a good idea in theory, but how, this is how it looks like in real life. Wow. Um, and so we, and we have it all year round. We have what is called the Mini Business World Program, which is kind of a crash course, a one-day session that goes oh, all cool. over the state talking to kids about here's why you should come to Business World in the summer. So it's, it's a year-round experience. It's also one of the only um, overnight programs. Like it. And I just think it's such, I mean, I love the idea of the business aspect of it, but also kind of the overarching theme that high school students get to go stay on a college campus and experience that before yeah. maybe they decide to go to college. Yeah. What a valuable experience. Yeah, I mean, exactly. the first time I heard about it, that's immediately what I thought of is, wow, I wish I could have had that experience and it could have prepared you so much more and just that growth and development that yeah. happens in that period. Yeah, it's it's huge. And it's it's such a critical time. Um, we originally were focusing on juniors going into senior year okay. in high school. And I think that that's such a crucial moment mm -hmm. in, in their career kind of academic career and even in their early adulthood because that's the summer that all the applications start if you're going to college or that's when you're starting scholarships. That's when you are starting to think, you know, maybe I don't even want to go to college. Maybe right. I want to just go right into the business uh, workforce. So it's, it's really a critical time. And we now don't expose just juniors going into senior year. We expose it to uh, 
business world to all ages um, in terms of in high school, freshman, sophomore, junior, and seniors. So it's really great. What an incredible experience and just such a great opportunity. Be sure to check them out. You can find all of their information on their website. You can find out how to register, um, the dates that are coming up. So be sure to check that out. Again, Jack with Wisconsin Business World, thank you for being with us yeah, today. Thanks for having me. We appreciate it. And we'll have you back again soon. Absolutely. Awesome. And we'll be back with more Talk of the Town here on Wisconsin's 57 right after this. Hey folks, welcome back to Talk of the Town. I'm Justin Riley, sitting in for just a moment for Ellen Barrett because we are talking storytelling today with Karen Wendt, who is Youth Services Coordinator with the Monona Public Library. Karen, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, and I'm excited to hear a little bit more about storytelling because this is an this is kind of an art form that has really uh, sort of lost its fervor, I think, over the years, but I think we're trying to bring it back, it sounds oh, like. Oh, yeah. It started coming back in the 70s. And yeah, yeah. It's big. So, tell, well, first of all, tell us what is storytelling? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of storytelling, mm -hmm. and uh, there's storytelling in the news, there's storytelling in music, there's storytelling in books, and then there's crafted storytelling where people talk from a stage sure. to a big audience. But today we're talking about a different kind of storytelling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about family stories. Okay. And family stories are when the teller shares a tale from their life or their family's life, and it's not memorized and right. it's told to an audience of one or maybe a gathering sure. and the listeners have a job too of being responsive and creating images okay so the memories uh, are there but the the way that the sentences and the paragraphs are strung together verbally are not planned is what you're what you're saying for family story it mm -hmm. may or may not be okay yeah okay it's so this it could be a true story or it could be something that you just kind of... They are true stories. They are true family stories. Story, family storytelling is always okay. true stories. Okay. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, there's a, a certain uh, thing that people do where they collect family stories. I mean, you hear about people collecting folk songs, collecting nursery rhymes, and some people collect family stories. So talk to us a little bit about what are a few things to remember if people out there want to collect some, some of their own family stories. The most important thing is to listen, to okay. listen to the family members who are talking to you, your aunts and your uncles mm -hmm. and grandma and grandpa, and if possible, take notes sure. or even get permission to record their voices. Sure. That would be one best way. But also collect the family stories of your family and your children and pass those on so that your children have a family history. Right. Absolutely. Also, you can get books that help you with collecting family stories. Wow, there's books <laughs> written on collecting family yeah, stories. That yep. is so cool. That is so cool. Yeah, Jerry Apps, um, keeping your, telling your story is one of them. I, I just, I have a question and I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here, but what do tip, pip, people typically do once they, let's say they do record grandma or aunt or uncle telling a story, what do they typically do with that? Do they transcribe it later on and put it on paper or do they just have have that recording as part of the, as, as the collection itself? There's such a wide variety of what people do. Okay. Um, I have some friends who are storytellers and they'll craft those memories from their ancestors into a storytelling uh, story that they can tell on stage. Okay. Um, other people might just keep them um, digitally in their computer or maybe sure. um, tucked into a book of family pictures. Lots of variety. Very cool, yeah. very cool. And why do you think that um, telling stories in the family is so important? Because they're true. Yeah, so um, those true stories are really important for family history. And no matter if Aunt Susie and Aunt you know, Nancy tell a different version of the same story, they're still true family stories, right? right? And so we want to collect those and preserve those, and we want to be able to keep those for our children and grandchildren. But if we don't know our family history, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, if we don't have that background, then we can start it ourselves yes. so that our great-great-grandchildren will have a family history. Start an oral tradition, in yes. other words. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, what are some benefits for families who do share stories? There's so many. Um, one study that I read talked about how narrative skills, which we get from reading to children as mm -hmm. well, are are increased in children who hear family stories. They're able to tell richer, fuller stories two, three years later to adults that they don't know. But also uh, self-esteem, 
confidence, problem-solving skills, coping skills, and one study wow. showed that a lack of uh, uh, lower rates of anxiety and depression as well. Wow, just from, from having storytelling in the yeah, family. Yeah, from having a family wow. heritage. And real quick before we go, we just have a few seconds left, but how can parents include storytelling in their daily routines? Reading lots of books, <laughs> but then when you're reading that book, create a dialogue mm -hmm. with your child. And if you would say, hey, that happened to me when I was little, make sure that you stop and tell your story mm -hmm. to your child. Also look for appropriate storytelling events in, in the area or, or ask your librarian for a list of questions on how to keep family stories alive. Karen Went from the Monona Public Library, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. If you want to learn more about storytelling, go to the website on your screen to find out more. And we'll be back with more Talk of the Town coming up right after the break. Stick around. Welcome back to Talk of the Town, and we are joined now by our news partner, Phil Anderson for U.S. Senate. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Ellen. It's less than a week away until the election. It is. So today we're talking about voting. And voting. First, I want to start off with why should people vote? Well, people need to have a voice, or should, I would think, want to have a voice in the affairs of their community. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. government's got a very powerful effect on our lives, all aspects of our lives, social, economic, whatever they might be. So to have a voice in that, I think, is really important. You know, as libertarians, we want less voting, actually, which might sound a little huh. uh, different. But we prefer to have people making decisions about their own lives rather than having to submit to the democratic process. Um, that's the best way to ensure the maximum amount of liberty and freedom. But insofar as things need to be governed, then people should go out and vote so they've got a voice. Why do you think people choose not to vote? I guess kind of going off of that. Well, I think people don't realize how much uh, effect government has on their lives. And they often feel that... Uh, that their vote doesn't make much of a difference. Mm -hmm. So whether that means they don't see a difference between Republicans and Democrats, or they don't think that uh, voting for anybody at all makes any difference whatsoever, they get a little bit uh, apathetic uh, because things don't seem to change. And that's something that, uh, that I and other libertarians want to affect change with, and that is so that people see a difference in political philosophies and that they actually have a choice. I think that's a theme I've heard in this election coming up here more than I have in the past. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of expanding on that, do you think there is a wasted vote? Well that's, a, I think that's a false narrative okay. that's, that's uh, perpetrated by uh, Republicans and Democrats to get you to disregard third parties. I think a wasted vote is if you cast your vote for somebody that you don't believe in mm -hmm. or that you are just sort of surrendering to. I think it's better to say don't surrender your vote than don't waste your vote because again if, if people don't agree with what Republicans and Democrats are doing, and there's a lot of dissatisfaction with what's going on in Washington, just holding your nose and voting for another Republican or Democrat isn't going to affect any change. If they see right. people moving to voting for Gary Johnson or Jill Stein, Stein or myself or whoever, that's going to make things change in Washington, not just holding your nose and voting for the usual suspects. So why should people vote for you this election? Well, I'm the only candidate running for Senate who has the who can really represent uh, people in Wisconsin and the federal government. And the reason I say that is anybody who is a Democrat or a Republican who's been put forward to be elected for offices uh, is already approved of by those parties, mm -hmm. kind of by the nature of how it works, which means that they're already agreeing to put party before principle, whereas I have the independence and the, the moral and political courage to say, this is wrong, we should do this, we shouldn't do that. And we've seen both of my opponents don't have the independence to do that because they're bound to their parties. That's a big difference. And, and I think it's important, even if you're not necessarily a libertarian, to actually be represented in Washington would be a relatively new thing, actually. Now, you've been campaigning for the last year. I have. I kind of want to take a second to look back. <laughs> a year. Wow. I know you've been a busy guy just uh, yep, getting yep. to know you over this time. Sure. What would you say is the biggest lesson you've learned over this past year? I think there's two, and they're sort of the same lesson. And number one is that people really do want to be represented, and they want hope for the future and not the sort of the same old politics. They're mm -hmm. really uh, tired of the negative politicking, which you've seen it get worse and worse and worse over the course uh, of this cycle with at both the presidential, Senate, congressional level. Uh, so they're really, really sick and tired of that. Um, and, but they're still very hopeful for the message that they can have representation in Washington. So it's sort of like a, a hope versus despair. And I think the whole election hinges on whether people are willing to go out and vote for hope and change, although that's another candidate's <laughs> motto from eight years ago, real hope and change sure. and, and dissent from the Washington uh, two-party two paradigm, as opposed to just either holding their nose and voting Republican and Democrat or Democrat 
or just not voting at all. I think you bring up an interesting point because that is a really big, I guess, concept or idea in this election, mm -hmm. and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. It will. I mean, based, especially with the presidential politics that are going on, there's all kinds of ways you can look at people that support Trump, people mm -hmm. support Clinton, how that affects down ticket, whether they're voting on principle or just with party uh, affiliations. It's going to be a very, very interesting uh, election night. Obviously, I'll follow it very closely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and we'll be, if anyone's interested, uh, we're going to be at Brokosh down on the square uh, election night, and, as well as representatives from the Gary Johnson campaign. So people should feel free to come down there and join us. We've only got a couple seconds left. Any final thoughts before we go? Well, I'd like to thank uh, Channel 57 for supporting me thank in this. You. It's been a fantastic relationship, and I hope it continues after the election. And I urge everyone to go vote. Again, mm -hmm. your, your vote is your voice. Your voice is your vote. So go vote and don't get trapped into voting for somebody you don't like or don't support. A fantastic message to end on. Awesome. Again, Philly Anderson for U.S. Senate, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. And we'll be back with more Talk of the Town right after this. Welcome back to Talk of the Town, and with me now I have Peter Robertson with RP's Pasta Company. You're the founder and CEO over there. Thanks for being with us today. Thank, thank you very much for having me. And pasta is one of my favorite things, so it's always great to talk about, right? I'm probably going to be have a growling stomach mid-segment <laughs> here. So first I want to know, what, why did you start making pasta? Well, yeah. what, what kid doesn't love pasta? That's true. You know, my mom, my mom was this fantastic home cook. I had great meals all my whole childhood life. Uh, I grew up in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Oh, so we cool. had a chocolate factory. I mean, it was like it was like, like a dream come true. Exactly, it was a kid's <laughs> paradise. Um, but pasta was the one dish that just stuck for me. I love it. I just love pasta. So, what makes RP's pasta so special? We're one of the few pasta companies in the nation that truly makes a fresh pasta. Mm -hmm. um, you see a lot of other uh, major national brands, and they go through what's called a pasteurization process, which is essentially it, it pre cooks. The pasta. Okay. Um, whereas, you know, my experiences that I had when I was traveling in Italy were true fresh pasta. It's a different flavor and a different texture, and so that's what we stick with is true fresh. Oh, absolutely incredible, and probably a first time experience for a lot of people who maybe haven't traveled to places like that. Mm hmm. Well, I exactly. I mean, most people are familiar with a box or a dry yeah. pasta. So. so, what is RP's most popular pasta and why? Um, I, well, when I originally started, the most popular pasta was definitely just your traditional, straightforward uh, fettuccine, linguine, like truly fresh. Um, yeah. We, we <laughs> just people, it's, it's a pantry item and everybody knows what to do with it. Um, we have gotten into some gluten free pastas, of course, like a four cheese tortelloni. Mm, <sighs> to die Blended for. with Wisconsin cheeses and, you know, it's, it's everybody's favorite. You're making me so hungry right now. I already know what I'm going to be making for dinner tonight. I already have it set in my mind. So who do you guys sell your pasta to? Who's your market, I guess? Uh, our main markets are uh, retail, which would be grocery stores. Okay. People go in and purchase it directly from a grocery store. And also to uh, restaurants. Um, sure. And we do sell across the country and throughout Canada. Um, and it's mostly been, the growth has been through word of mouth. It's just, again, back to the true fact that it's a true fresh pasta. So people just really like it. So it's word of mouth gets, gets it around. Once you can get it to people and they try it, I'm sure they never want to go back. You got that. <laughs> so any places that we could find to find your pasta in the stores? Oh, absolutely. Um, Woodman's was one of my first stores right. that I ever got into in 1996. Uh, and since then, we've been selling to most of the other uh, Willie Street Co-op, Century. Awesome. Um, yeah, just wonderful places. So a lot of different places that mm -hmm. people can check you out. So are you guys develop anything new that could be coming out soon in the pasta world? Yes. Uh, in the gluten-free category that we started back in 2008, which has been a really wonderful growth for us uh, sure. throughout the country, uh, we'll finally be coming out with a filled gluten-free product, which will be very unique for the gluten-free category. Uh, we're coming out with a four cheese tortelloni that's gluten free and a cheese and spinach agnolotti, which is like a half moon Ooh. or a mezzaluna ravioli. And oh, they're both so good. That you, sounds you, incredible. They are good. That's not something I've ever tried before. So that would be in the shape of a half moon, you mm -hmm. said? Yep. Okay. Interesting. And filled with things inside. Yep. Cheese and spinach. Oh, good stuff. 
but the, the cheese, you know, the spinach makes up for the cheese, right? Makes it into a healthy dish because <laughs> right, it's fresh. Exactly. That's what I like to think in my mind. So any challenges for RP's pasta and either business side or maybe out of the business world that you guys face? Well, I would say, yeah, we have huge challenges and it's it's the challenges of making a great product. Mm -hmm. um, we've been growing at a, at a pace. It's out uh, outmatched, you know, some of my abilities to run a company and we're just finding you know, we need more space. We need, you know, more equipment. And, you know, when you need more equipment, but you don't have the space, then you know, it's like, is it, you know, the cart before the horse. And then so you need to find a space, then order equipment. So it, it ends up being that there's many, many more facets to be dealt with and managed. And it's fun. It's a challenge. And the bottom line is it's still great food. And so we still love doing it. And you guys are based out of Madison. That is correct. Oh, how cool that you guys are doing this, you know, right here. Right here. In our community. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. And again, before we go, let's just go over one more time where people mm -hmm. can find your yummy pasta in the stores or check you guys out online as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, you know, here in Madison, uh, Woodman, Century on uh, Midvale, uh, the Willie Street Co-ops, you know, and numerous other stores. Actually, hy V, uh, cool. they've come to town to do well. And also we're available in a lot of the restaurants. A lot of the restaurants in town also serve our pasta. Awesome. So something, a good point to maybe ask your server. What kind of mm -hmm. pasta are you serving? Absolutely. Very cool. Again, Peter Robertson with RP's Pasta Company. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you to all of our guests. And thank you for watching today. You can watch us again on Wisconsin's 57.